Thank you, Simon. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I don't know the names, but the faces are definitely familiar. And that's good and bad. It's bad because I got some reused slides here. And you'll probably, probably say, man, we've seen that before, Pete. But I've got a new spin and a new story on the old slides. And I've got some new slides that have a new spin and a new story. And look, I, I sure don't want to take an hour. Nobody can stay attentive for probably 45 minutes. And I told Simon I've broken this presentation. It's almost in four chunks. So if I see you dozing off or you're making a lot of noise, we're going to cut it off on one of those chunks. And I've, I've tried to jam in the investment part of it in the first half so that if you doze off after the first half, you've still picked up the majority of what you came for. And you're definitely diehards if you came here for mining, like I am. Because when I came here in 82, I think there were 130 listed mining shares. And there was probably five times that many mining companies. And today, there's maybe 55 listed mining shares in this country. There's probably only about 55, 60 real companies. So it's really shrunk. And the second half of this presentation, I'll show you why. And it'll give you an idea, is it going to come back? My boss says you guys have to read this and know it to keep us safe. So ask me afterwards, and I'll send you the slide. You can read it at home. Half the world's minerals, and no one mining them. And that's pretty much the truth when you see how many people we've retrenched. 440,000 people on the gold mines alone. We've got half the world's gold, and we've retrenched 440,000 men in 20 years. Something's not right. 6,150 abandoned mines in the greatest commodity boom the world's ever seen. OK, rules. Huh? Investing is about rules. Rule number one in life, where are you on the curve? You know, before you complain and move out of your house, before you complain and move out of your country, make sure you know that the place you're going to is better than where you're leaving. South Africa, we're three times, three and a half times larger in Japan, Germany, five times bigger in the UK, 12 times larger than Korea. One of the problems is we are worth about eight times less than the Western world countries. So even though we've got people in this country, especially in government, that are spending money like we're as rich as the states, we're not. But the real, real effect, killing the mines today, 2,000 pieces, and I'm going to say negative legislation, because none of that legislation helps the mines. 2,000 pieces of legislation since 1994. Now, I used to run up the mountain quite a bit when I was younger. But if you put 2,000 marbles in my backpack, I'm not going to make it. You know, you can put maybe 100, maybe 200, but 2,000 pieces, 3,000 policy changes. Even scarier, government has spent 15 and a half trillion in today's terms since 94, but where is it? Okay, for 110 years, the resource index was 50% of our stock market. Now it's 15. It's not even really 15. Billiton doesn't even have anything in this country anymore. Anglos has less than half, Sassel a quarter. So this 15 of the Aussies and misnomer, we're actually down to about 8% of our stock market is now in this country, from 50% for 110 years to about eight or nine. Okay, I'm just going to mention the budget because that's probably the most watched event that government does all year. I even watched some of it. And I'm a mining guy, so I'm looking, what does it say about mining? Mining used to be number one in this country, right? Ignore the royalties. They're so small, and this is forecast and budgeted. But I didn't see any mention of mining industry in this year's budget. I didn't see the word jobs. Now, I did look through it twice, kind of quick, and it was late at night. But you would have thought there'd be jobs splattered all over our budget. And you'd think mining would have been mentioned once. I didn't see it once. The mining taxes he wants to propose, he wants to put them on the same level as somebody running a Kool-Aid stand or an IT company that doesn't take any risk, doesn't put up any capital. It's, it's insane. So if anybody is against mining, it's got to be Davis. There is zero mention in the budget of even stimulating mining. But how can you stimulate something that you haven't mentioned? 
And why talk about job creation when you never use the J-O-B word anyways? Government debt's now two trillion. In 09, it was one trillion. So we've doubled our debt six, seven years. Worse, there's no intention or plan to ever pay any of that debt back. Ask one politician, are we ever gonna pay some back? What's the plan? They will look at you like you're a Martian. Gordon, he makes lots of optimistic assumptions, but he's just dreaming, hoping, and wishing. They didn't want to mention privatization, but they're going to sell minority stakes. But they're probably going to have to sell it to each other because nobody else is going to buy it. How does Treasury enforce bad spending habits? Gordon is one man. He can't change culture, ideology, habits. Too much money is being wasted. Only growth can save South Africa, but government has totally lost how to get growth. Now, everybody remembers the bad days. Just read the history books. Those were bad days. Apartheid bared its head. We got kicked out of all kinds of international organizations. Funding was severely limited. This is the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. As bad, metal prices were flat. We were coming down off World War II. Metal prices were going nowhere. So we had a lot going against us then. Riots in the streets, total sanctions, bad metal prices, and we still stumbled along at 5% growth. Now, everything's in our favor. The biggest commodity boom the world's ever seen, a very, very weak rand. The world loves us. They give us all the funding we want. Everybody's free to do what they want. What are we talking this year? Is it 0.9 in the paper? You know, 0.9. So, Everything's in our favor and we can't grow. Everything was against us and we we're growing like crazy. Go figure. There's where Oppenheimer ran Anglos. He started in 17, World War I. Okay, he had a little bit of a spurt in the gold price and then it went down. And yet he put all his money back in the ground, built fall reefs, built the free state gold mines, Western deeps. All that was done under a pretty cock environment for gold. Now we've got a gold price up here, and we can't close mines fast enough. But look at the rest of the world. They love this gold price. They're flying. But gold price is irrelevant to us. doesn't matter what it does. We just produce less. And we know the consequences of that. No jobs. But... We're busy laying people off. At the same time, we're busy making more. Something's not right. I think the psychologists call that cognitive dissonance, right? Your left hand is gouging your eye out, and your right hand is trying to wipe the blood and, and put um, eye wash in. And that's what we've seen me doing here. So we used to produce 1,000 tons of gold when we had 23 million people. Now we're barely producing 100 tons of gold, and we got 54 million people. So it's not a recipe for success or for getting rich. And you can see the revenues. We're now making as much off gold as we made 1929. And how many people we have then? 10 million people? 8 million? So we're making less money on gold than back then. So it's no wonder the country's getting poor by the day. And unemployment continues to run. We're closing mines left and right. It's just adding to the unemployment. And yet, we've got a, a double whammy on the gold price. We've got something called the RAND. The rest of the world has to operate in dollars. So we've got a RAND. And look, if you were Forrest Gump and you like gold, you'd be making 15% a year in RANDs, yes. But you want to tell me when our inflation rate is 6, 7, 8, a mine can't make money when it gets 15% increase in revenue? What would Bill Gates do, Stephen Jobs, Google, if they got 15% more revenue with the same product every year? You couldn't even conceive the money they would make. Oppenheimer made all those millions, hundreds of millions when the gold price was flat. Now it's going up 15% a year, and all we can do is close mines. So we go from Western Deep Levels, the world's most ambitious modern mine and expensive at the time. It was a billion dollar underground mine, something the world had never seen in 1982 when I came here. Is this a new Oppenheimer, the new mining house? 
This is our new gold industry, organizing themselves. They pay no taxes, no royalties. There's no health insurance here, no medical, no hostels. And yet every year, look, they're already up to 15 billion a year. And this is two years old. So this is what we've, we've changed our mining environment to. We're now stripping and destroying mines. This was Buffalo's number 10. I saw the movie Gold by Roger Moore, 1974. It was filmed at Buffalo's. That's what really made me want to come here. Just watching the movie, I had to come here. This is what's left of Buffalo's. There's still 20 million ounces in the ground, but who's going to get it now? They're even trying to burn a cement head frame. You know, do we hate mining that bad? Shaft sinking. If you don't sink shafts, you don't get to the gold. Not only did we stop sinking shafts, we're now filling them in. Anybody want to guess what Stalin would do if you were destroying state assets? You wouldn't get to the train to go to the gulag. You'd be executed on the spot. And yet we've got the DMR working with the industry, filling in shafts that still give access. A shaft is like a skyscraper. It's got an infinite life. It always has a purpose. Even if the ore was gone, you use it for pumping, use it for ventilation, secondary escapeway, access to another mine. And look at 1905, we were sinking 15, 17 kilometers a year with chisels and buckets. Now we got the most modern shaft sinking in the world, we're sinking none. And we still got half the world's gold. But we don't care if we close gold mines because we're replacing them with shopping malls from 65 gold mines to eight. But look at the growth in shopping malls. Property shares, five property unit trusts in the 80s, 65 gold mines. Now it's reversed, 67 property shares. Property's good, you can deduct the interest and you know inflation and the weak rand will make it go up. It's a no brainer, who wants gold shares when you got property, high inflation and paper money? Even better, casinos. Close the mines, open casinos. In 1985, you had five casinos. 2015, you got 37. And look at the employees. So who needs gold mines when you got casinos, shopping malls, and property development? Okay, we're a pygmy. We still produce maybe 56 billion, but when you figure oil is 2.2 trillion, natural gas one, Steel and mining, two trillion, we're a pygmy. In the early 80s, we were 50% of mining on the planet. Listed mining shares, 50%. Now we're not even two. Look at gold. All of this is your precious metals. That's gold, platinum, diamonds as a percent of the total in the world. We are only 5% of this little teeny bit. That's how small we've got it. You know, at one time we were 70% of that, which would have been half the gold in the world, more even. Investing in resources. Okay, I, I think that's why Simon got you here. You wanna learn a little bit about investing, not history. Let's talk about Forrest Gump asset management. Huh? What's your benchmark? What asset class are you looking at? Equities, property, bonds, cash. We all know earnings drive share prices. Forget the hype, forget IT. Most shares over time are only gonna be sustained by earnings. And metal prices drive earnings on mining shares, right? Currency, it does have a big effect. NAV can help. If it's a closed mine or a new mine and they're not generating earnings, you can calculate some kind of NAV. And sentiment, yes. Sentiment does move share prices, but you can't predict it. You don't know when it's coming. You don't know how long it's going to last. So I'm always wary about buying something on sentiment. Change is too quick. A good company's earnings don't change that quick. Okay, so what's our benchmark? Rule number two in life. Everybody's got to have a benchmark, otherwise you're lost. Don't even get on a boat unless you got a compass, a map. Now, most people in life at least start with the S&P 500. And it's averaged about 10% a year in dollars, probably for 100 years. I only show, uh, what, about 60 years here. But 
plus or minus, you're going to get 10% of your money. That's probably the lowest risk equity investment you can make. That's your benchmark. So you're not going to buy a mining share unless it's going to do better than this, right? Okay, who doesn't know this guy? All right, check him, Simon. Everybody says they know him. When they leave, ask him. All right, I think we all do know who he is. Okay, do we need to know this guy? There's a lot of good reasons. Just one of them, why Warren Buffett is famous. Everybody, anybody here know about his million dollar bet with the 510 hedge fund managers? Huh? How's he doing? They're working their tails off, I can tell you that. The hedge fund managers are working very hard. That doesn't look like a guy that's working very hard to me though. Anyways, that's the score last I checked. In eight years, he's up 67. And he's laughing at the audience at his annual um, shindig, saying, but why are you guys surprised? You guys love paying fund managers big fees to underperform. It makes you feel good. I worked for a boss who did that. He said, Pete, I don't need one fund manager. I'm going to go get the 10 best. Now he's down 50%. But I said, at least you hired the best, Mark. You know, it's not like you hired bums. And believe me, Warren isn't taking on bums here. He's taking on a very well-known funds of funds manager. I'm not going to mention him because I don't want to get sued. But this guy specifically chose the best of breed. <laughs> Thank heavens. Huh? Can you imagine if he had chose bums? Okay, rule number three, keep the odds in your favor. Now, Warren likes the S&P 500. But we know in this business, nothing stays great forever. So Warren's timing was good. He chose in 2008, that's when the bet was, and that's the only year the hedge funds beat him was 2008, because I think the S&P fell about 35%, they fell about 15. But after that, he's beat him every year. Still, this is the S&P versus a world index. It's had a good run. Now Warren says he's gonna stay in. You know, I'm a little bit of a technical guy. I say, hey, I think war reversion to the mean, Warren. You know, maybe I'd get ready to start shorting the S&P and I'd go long the world for a bit. But not Warren. He's not going to budge. He thinks this thing is going to go up even more. So everybody, you pay money, you take your choice. It's your money. But Warren has chose a pretty good benchmark. Earnings drive share prices. So that S&P didn't go up on sentiment, didn't go up on smoke and mirrors, went up on earnings. They have come down the last year and a half, this is where it gets tricky. Are they going to keep coming down or will they turn and go up? And if you look at the run today, the S&P thinks these earnings are going to go up pretty quick. I think it's up 200 points or is it the Dow? Yeah, it's, it's smoking. Look, I don't know how. You know, I thought when it came down here, it stayed for a while. Look, it just went right back up. So Warren, he's a lot older than me. He just stays in. But earnings drive your index. Okay, there's our benchmark, 12% a year in dollars. And that's as it should be. If you're taking money out of America coming to Africa, you want some extra for that, huh? You're not going to take money out and go for a lower benchmark. So we have delivered. We got more volatility, but we have delivered 2%, except maybe the last three and a half, four years. So your question to yourself is, is this temporary or is it going to be maybe a long 10 years? Maybe it's going to be forever. That's, that's what we got to decide here. Historically, we did good, but look at here. We've now done nothing for about 12 years. Not a good sign. And the gold index. It's hard to believe pension funds always put clients into gold shares. My college pension fund, Montana School of Mines, we had South African gold shares in it until my last year, 1981, we were forced to kick them out. They'd had gold shares in there for 100 years. And why? You got 14% TRR, total rate of return. So you were taking money out of America and getting 10. You were bringing it here in gold shares, but they weren't perceived as that risky then. You know, the return made up for the risk. Okay, that all ended in around 88, 89. Since then, you know, we underperformed in the 60s, but that's because gold had gone flat for 40 years. You know, how long can you cut costs? How much more efficient can you get? Once gold took off, though, 
This is versus the Aussie. And remember, gold shares gave you a double dividend from the Aussie. If the Aussie was three, you got six on gold. If the Aussie is four, you got eight. So this is just capital. But your dividend really carried you. But it can't carry you here. So yes, we had a lovely bounce here. We had capitulation. We had capitulation here, lovely bounce. But is that an investment, you know, or is that gambling? You know, investment, you should be able to sleep and go away like Warren. That's why he's so relaxed and laughing all the time. He doesn't look at his S&P 500 ETF. Okay. And the Aussie versus the S&P? You know, it's kind of been cyclical. So on a relative price, it's looking a bit cheap. I like stuff outside of standard deviation. You know, to me, that's, that's a great sign to sell. That's a great sign to buy. So we're getting close there, but you got to keep one eye on your environment. You know, this applies if the environment is relatively stable. But if your environment really changes, then these old rules don't apply so well. And the resi versus the alzi was also cyclical, had its ups and downs. But look how far it came this time. It broke all known limits. These are 150-year lows, all-time lows. And you got to say... Is this a secular change, not a cyclical? Is it now secular, which means it's a trend that can't change? And that's a big, big worry in mining shares in this country. And look at our index in dollars, just the index. It's now where it was in 1980. That's not an investment when something you're holding falls where it was 36 years ago. And why did it fall? Because the earnings fell. The earnings are roughly where they were in 74 when I was getting out of high school, watching gold on TV. In fact, it wasn't TV. You had to go to the theater to watch gold, cinema. You know, this, this is a, a complete Nagasaki Hiroshima. And yes, maybe it'll bounce, maybe it'll recover. In this country, it's going to be very tough. Worldwide, it will adjust. And the gold index, yes, we've had a lovely run here this year, but it's leveling off, came down another 4% today. I think it's, it's shot its bolt. And really, why did it go up? It didn't just go up because it had sold down. It went up because dollar gold went up 20 some percent and the RAND weakened simultaneously. So it was a great one-two punch. Nobody could have forecast either, but boy, if you were in the shares, you benefited. But look at that. You know, gold had been falling five or six years, up 22%, and look how quick it was. So naturally, you get caught in the slipstream. Even bad gold shares went up when the gold price in dollars went up like that. And the same with the RAND. There's 20% depreciation. You know, beautiful one-two punch. You couldn't forecast either of those on their own, but together they were fantastic, but probably temporary. They're not going to change the environment here. The resi. Now, I know I was on radio, I was on TV. Everybody's asking me in December, January, hey, should we be looking at golds or platinum? I said, no, not in this country. Okay, maybe I was too negative. But I was saying, you can buy the resi, it's safe. You get four or five to one gearing. You buy a resi ETF, four or five to one gearing, depending what broker you buy it from. You got Billiton, you got Anglos, you got Sassel, you got a little bit of gold and platinum. So I'm a wimp, I'm 61. I'm not sitting at my desk every day trying to stare at gold shares like I did for Ned Core, or Alan Gray. So even the resi, you made 70%. It's a lot safer. The Indy, Indy looks safer than anything. But after that run, I don't know how much is left. It's too amazing for words. I think there was an article on the PIC. They were bragging up, sure, we gave a billion bucks to buy a newspaper and we're promoting the disadvantaged people of South Africa but we're still getting good returns. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought they said we've gone from 1 trillion to 1.7 trillion in the last eight years. Okay, 70% in eight years. Can you imagine if they were in the Indy? They'd gone from 100 to 850. Eight and a half times. If the PIC closed shop and did a Warren Buffett and just bought the index, they would have been up at least three or four times instead of up 70%. Resi TRR, zero return in 10 years. I guess after a run like that, and after the changes in our environment, we should have seen it coming. 
Resi versus Indy. It was cyclical for 100 years, up and down, up and down like a sine wave. This is not cyclical. This is a real break. Yes, it's bounced, but can it get back up to the mean? Major lives and dies on reversion to the mean, but I can't see it. But I'll tell you why. There is a slight chance it can get there. We'll see further slides. So yeah, you know, that reversion to the mean, it's hard to break the rule of gravity, God's laws, Newton's laws. But um, that's a hell of a fall. And the PEs, see, they're not too different. You know, the long-term average is the RISI PE is 0.9 of the Indy. So it trades at a 10% discount. So it's, you know, it's not too far. So it, it's not like RISIs are really cheap on a PE basis. But when you see the earnings have grown here for 12 long years, whereas the earnings here have been falling dramatically for five or six. So you are buying the resi on pretty trough earnings, and you'd be selling the NZ at, on peak earnings. Three-month T-bill. This is what people are saying are, are going to make commodities go up or down. They say if, if it stays here, inflation will be stoked, commodities will go up, which means the commodity shares will go up. But if this starts going up dramatically, that will put pressure on all commodity prices, and then your resis are going to come down again. So this is probably a bigger call. You know, the RAND, we know the RAND's going to go weak. That's a safe call. We got to call the, the commodity price itself. And that's probably, probably as related to interest rates as any other figure I've got. So let's look at commodity prices. Oil, oil 47. What a coincidence. Long-term price of oil is 48, and today I saw it trading at 47.50. Looks like gravity still works on oil. Reversion to the mean. Coal. I don't know what the mean is here. It's probably about 60. I see Richards Bay coal is trading around 54. But man, anybody that was buying up there, he believed in another world than the one we inhabit. Platinum. Same story. I think the long-term price, if you average it, it's around 900. Maybe 950. So this was la-la land. This is real land. Now, it doesn't mean it can't go down. Huh? That's just the mean. As we know, a lot of things stay at the mean 50% of the time. They stay above the mean the other 50. So I never like making decisions at the mean. You know, I, I love a standard deviation on top or below. It's, it's just safer. It's Forrest Gump type investing. Buying stuff at the mean, that's a mugs game. Could go either way. Iron ore. If this isn't Looney Tunes, nothing is. And yet, this is where all the new iron ore companies were formed. Nearly a trillion dollars went into building new iron ore companies in the last 10 years. You know, it's what the third most common element on the planet. So a trillion dollars of investors were investing with iron ore, including the red-headed lady running Anglos. She also thought, this is the new world. Yes, I'm happy to invest. Eight, nine, ten billion in iron ore up here at 120 because I think it's going to 140. Man, if you read what I do, there's no reason it's going above 60 in my lifetime. The guys can make money at 20, 25 dollars. So I don't see it ever, ever going to 100. Gold. This is the anomaly. This is the Joker in the deck. I haven't a clue what's up there. You know, they tell me, well, the people are pretty scared about the world, Pete. And I hear it. I'm, I'm petrified of the world. But I don't think that's enough reason to make it double its long-term average. But look, it's holding up there. It's holding. But again, I've already said, I don't like buying stuff when they're above the mean that far. <coughs> you know, I'd rather be selling things that far above the mean and buying things here. So... Major puts approach with caution. You know, put a skull and crossbones on this investment. Um, not so much that it's toxic, but it could lead to damaging your health. Base metal index. Okay, I like this one. It's not quite a standard deviation down, but look, that's a big correction. So I'm happy buying copper, nickel, zinc, lead. They're dull, they're boring, but I got a lot of margin here. All right, 
Anybody feel like this guy? If you don't, it means you weren't in mining. Because this is me, believe me. I feel like this guy the last 10 years. And I think he's going to stay in, if he's in this country, he's going to stay like that for, for a lot more years if he's in mining. The Aussie is not cheap relative to the S&P. We're actually trading at a bit of a premium to our average. And I am a firm believer in averages. So, hey, we're worried about a ratings downgrade. Yeah, downgrade us to the mean. You know, we're still trading on a premium to the S&P 500, to our average. Don't ask me why. Maybe it's because 70% of our market isn't really South African. It's Naz Pears, South African breweries, Richemont. So maybe, maybe the world's not so dumb and it sees it's a fake South African stock market. 70% is really China and America. So, okay, but still, maybe that would take us to point eight. But I'm not comfortable up here. The gold index. This is why guys bought it. Look at that. You had an 11% dividend yield for 30 years almost. Then it came down, you had 8% for about another 50 years. Now where's our dividend yield on gold? Anybody got an idea? What's a gold share pay in dividends? Zero, geez, that's not a dividend. <laughs> that's theft. Now, zero's not too far off, it got close. So maybe they're paying 1.25, you're right. In my book, there's no difference between 1% and zero. So I agree. You know, a dividend is like here. Uh, I want four or five percent. Maybe in America I'll take a three, but in this country, what's inflation? Seven, eight. The gold index, it fell to where it was when I was in diapers. That's not an investment. Ran up, held capitulation, regained, got back on its feet, but it ran into a wall. In fact, it ran into a moving train because right when it got back on its feet, government nationalized the mines and implemented the first mining charter. And we can talk all night about that, but it's one disastrous page, one disastrous paragraph after another. So yes, we've had a huge bounce, like we said, from capitulation, just like we had here, just like we had there. So if you're a, an analyst, you're industrious, you sit at your screen every day, you read everything that comes, and you're patient, you will get one of these big bounces every seven, eight years, 10 years. But geez, that's not investing. That's missing more opportunities than you're finding. And why did gold fall? Because there's no friggin' earnings anymore. It's that simple. There's the earnings. Lowest earnings in 120 years, i.e. zero. In fact, there was losses. Look at Nothing but losses for about five years. So maybe up through the 90s, you can build models, stock pick, stay glued to your stream, go through a divorce. Maybe you could outperform if you did all those things, but you can do them all now. I don't think you're going to add much alpha in mining stocks. Not on, not on a regular basis. The platinum index, same story, vaporized. But I see Matunjwa, he's going to hit them where it hurts. He says they're still making billions. I don't know who his accountant is, but he says he's checked. They're hiding profits. But I've noticed in my conversations with certain union leaders, they do not know the difference between revenue and earnings. But I hope everybody here does, because if not, you're in bad shape. There's a big difference between revenue and earnings, and the sooner the union finds it, the sooner they can slow down their job losses. But yeah, platinum. Everybody who bought a platinum share there, if he held on, he's lost. Everybody. Not one man got left behind. They all got vaporized. Hiroshima, huh? How many survivors in Hiroshima? Within three, four Ks, none. That's how it was. Now today, and this is earnings. Huh? This thing didn't fall because of sediment. Didn't fall because of Joseph Batunjwa. It fell because there's no friggin' earnings. Lawn men. It was the world's worst investment for five or six years. Yes, I've heard stories, I've seen. It has been the world's best investment this year. But is it gonna last? And is that reason enough to get into it? 
And you know, if you bought Lawnman here at five bucks, you wrote it down to 50 cents. What's that? That's a 90% loss, right? Now it goes to two and a half. No, no, that's five, 500 cents. It went down to half a cent. You know, that's a 99% loss. Now it's about, what, three cents? You know, I'm happy if it's three cents and I bought it at one. But I don't think anybody here is happy. I'm, I'm glad the PIC stepped in. They did save 35,000 jobs. I don't know how long, but it, it's good they saved 35,000. I've seen the PIC waste a lot more money on newspapers saving no jobs. In fact, I think after they made that investment, they fired people. At least this one, they kept jobs. Lawn men and dollars. Okay, half a cent to uh, three cents. All right, let's compare. We got five, five ways of investing our money, right? Property, bonds, equities, cash. What's the last one? Yeah, Melville, I knew it. <laughs> Gold, you're right. Let's see where we are with these. All Z versus the all bond. Had a pretty nice run, but for the last three years, it's treading water. And I wouldn't be surprised if bonds did outperform for the next three, four, five years. Because um, I think world equity markets are a bit pricey, especially the states. So I don't think this is an easy call, but I know what Warren Buffett would do, huh? He'd just stay long. But it's, it's had a great run versus bonds. Um, it might still outperform, but it, it's, it's not going to do it by a mile. Aussie versus cash, aha. Uh -huh. Already slipping. When did it peak? 2014 was the peak. So you've actually done better in cash. Going forward, look, if you think things are risky out there, what's cash giving you? Maybe 8%? Guaranteed. You know, the LZ isn't guaranteed. The LZ today is trading where it was two and a half years ago. Krugerrands. Ooh. I don't want to make this call. Sucks, huh? right at the mean. Tough, tough call. Maybe Dave could do it. Dave's bullish. Could be right. All Z versus Krugerrands. If it keeps going down, it means Krugerrands are winning. So one thing's for sure, despite all the volatility, whatever you bought here, it's the same now. So you did the same buying the All Z as the guy who bought Krugerrands since when is that, 99? Pretty interesting. Sassel versus the Alzi. Hmm. Okay, it is at the mean. I would definitely lean long Sassel. I think I'd rather hold Sassel than the Alzi. Even if oil doesn't go up, and I think oil will. Too many countries and companies survive on oil. They'll figure a way to make it go up. And in the meantime, we got guys in Pretoria working night and day how they make that RAND go down more. So, you know, it's two pretty good reasons to have some Sassel, I think, in your fund. Sorry, ignore the Sassel, it's Billiton. I don't know what happened here. I don't think Billiton's looking too bad, huh? That's, that's my territory, huh? Standard deviation out of the mean. Biggest mining company in the world, great assets. Sure, they got a potential lawsuit in Brazil, but Brazil also wants jobs. They're not going to nail them too much. I like Billiton. That's, that's, if you buy there and you're wrong, you're not going to be wrong very much, and I don't think you're going to be wrong very long. All right, and this is what happened. We got people in Pretoria basing legislation and policies on abnormal conditions. They're rewriting mining legislation. They think this is normal. But you guys have heard Peter Major. This isn't normal, it's abnormal, right? It's outside of standard deviation. This is Forrest Gump investing here. Look at that. There's normal. 400 years. That's what commodity prices do. They revert about the mean. And yet we've written 2,000 pieces of legislation are based on this. Don't make policies up here. Don't even make investments up here. Do nothing up here except run. Because <laughs> it won't stay.
won't last. It's not safe. Okay, the DRC, they also destroyed their mining industry. But amazing, they resurrected it. You had Anglos and a couple of companies build the most wonderful, high-tech, modern copper industry the world's seen. It rivaled Chile, Chile and the States. They built it up from the teens, the 20s. Then what happened? It's that dirty word. But Le Malema uses that word, and he's right. You had a regime change here. They didn't like the way the industry was. So what happened? Tanked. And then somebody down here got fed up. They didn't like producing 40,000 tons of copper when they used to produce half a million. This is an amazing story. I don't have anything like it. To see a country that had so destroyed its industry, made a regime change, threw the bums out, threw all that mining legislation out, said, guys, just come in and mine. And I'm telling you, this is real. This is tens of billions of dollars. It's foreign money. And, but look how long it took from 03 until 15. A million tons of copper produced a year out of the DRC. It's, it's an unbelievable success story. And that's all they changed, those six bad letters. <laughs> hey, it wasn't a fluke. Here's another country. Also had a regime change. They were producing 900,000 tons of copper. They couldn't stand all the money rolling in. They couldn't stand the modern industry. Well, they fixed that, Kowunda. They threw the bums out. They threw out the mining legislation and policies. And we'll do it too. It won't be in my lifetime, but eventually, whoever follows will eventually get fed up. The reason they didn't hit a million is somebody was running for election had second, second thoughts. He doubled the royalties. He played with the taxes. He manipulated the VAT. So they didn't get to a million. They could have got to a million like the DRC, but they had second changes. They better make up their mind quick or they're going to have another one of these. Hey, South Africa, I forgot we produced copper. It started going down the same time gold did. Unions brought the industry to a halt and the mines realized we're no longer in control. Bigger forces are in control. But I don't see it going up yet. What do you think we need here, guys? Regime change. <laughs> Hope this isn't being recorded. <laughs> um, mining policy regime, right? <laughs> Our productivity sucks. Huh? That's ounces per man. Look at that. Yeah, talk about reversion to the mean. We're producing the same ounces per man is in 1909. And we know how we mined in 1909. Now you got hydraulic drills, water drills, electric drills, LHDs, dump trucks. What good is it? All the modern technology, we're only doing the same. That's how backwards we've gone. We haven't stagnated, we've gone backwards. And who's losing on that? Everybody. And we know government loves demonizing the mining industry, but if, if I look at the numbers that I've added up, and this is off Chamber of Mines and Annual Reports. Government made a hell of a lot more money out of the gold mines than the mines did. But here they've made nothing. So you'd think government would care. But see, government has other sources of income. They have debt. They can sell state assets. They can print money. They can tax. So they don't really care. But the mines only had one source. It was getting gold out of the ground. That's what the legislation and policies have done here. We should have had a, a bigger boom here. This was a 10-year bull run, and gold's still high. Look at the revenue. We're now making as much off gold as we made in 1939, 1940, before the war. $8 million. $8 billion we made then. With what? 12 million people? Now we got $55 million sharing the same gold. Employment down. Mines used to employ 800,000. Subsidiary industries, 1.2 million. Australia, they're exporting two to three times what we do. Do we have freedom and meritocracy on the mines? Ask the unions. They'll say, yeah, you got total freedom. You can choose which union you want to join. I said, what about no union? Both unions wanted to kill me. 
population. And people say, oh, the grades are too low. That's why we're not mining so much gold. I just spent half the last week with six Chinese engineers, all as old as me, that spent four, five, six days on one of the old Valry shafts, the lowest grade shaft, Taulakoa. It's got two and a half times the grade of their underground gold mine. They were impressed. Even though Anglos built it 30 years ago, they're impressed. They're amazed. They can't believe our grades. That's what you get when you dig a ton of gold out of the ground. That's in today's terms, $220. It's only been that high a few times. We say it's not enough. But we love open pit mines, huh? Ten times more destructive. And this one was funded with government money. $3.2 billion government money. This is a platinum mine. Do you know how wide the platinum reef is? It's about a meter. See, you can see it. Can't you see it? It's right there. So we make that great big hole to get a little bit of platinum. I came here because this country is a world leader in underground mining. I don't know where this thing came from. And that's all we do now. Ten times the damage of an open pit. The savior. He's the most feared man in mining. I agree. I agree he is feared. But is that good? You know, do you want to be feared? Is that how you build a country? By being feared? Like Stalin, Hitler? Is this how you negotiate? Oh, everybody's got ideas how to help mining. The minister, head of Communist Party. All these people, investors. He's getting a good work over, all right? Both sides. High cost. I could write forever about the high cost on our mines. Who's in charge? Is nobody in charge? If you listen to radio and TV, everybody's in charge. I'm arguing with housewives half the time during the week, telling me why are they paying slave wages? Why are we so unproductive? Why don't we mechanize? Everybody knows how to run gold mines now. Now you got unions fighting over in the tables of mine. And we had a guy, radical Ramath Lodi. He says, I'm going to fix this thing once and for all. I'm tired of messing around. You guys are kids. He's got ambitious plans. He's a... He supposedly is a lawyer, but he's got ambitious plans how he's going to fix the whole industry that took geniuses and billions a hundred years to make. These are the guys who are fixing the industry. They know how to survive. They don't play by any of Ramath Lodi's laws. Tons of debt. We're learning the wrong stuff from America. We've doubled our debt in five years to two trillion. It's going to be four trillion in five more years. Anybody want to bet me? I won't be alive to collect, but I will win. It will be four trillion in five years. We already went through this. Too many reasons. I think I had this last year, or did I? Valentino Rossi, he's going to fix our industry. He rode for Honda, nobody could touch him. Yamaha begged him, he says, why do I want to leave the best and ride for second rate? But the press worked on him nonstop. Eventually, he caved in. He went and knocked on Yamaha's door. They all had a heart attack. They had to reach for their pills. He says, do you want me? He wanted to prove to himself in the world, I am a world champ. I can take any bike and win. But boy, did he find a mess at Yamaha. They didn't know how to set up a bike for racing. They didn't know how to improve it. They had the money. They had the expertise. But it was the system, the way they did it. He helped them. Now him and his teammate win every bloody race. How? Kaizen. Japanese word for improvement. You make one little change. If it works, you make another. If it doesn't, you back up. You don't do 100 changes. That's what Yamaha's doing. They were reinventing their friggin' engine every race, reinventing the bike. At Honda, it was just little changes. Pump more air in the tire. Let some out. Meritocracy, productivity. There is no other way. Last bit of the slides. Five, six slides. I think I had this, but I'm assuming you guys have Alzheimer's like me, huh? Who's not colorblind? Who can see this is green? When America wanted to build a transcontinental railroad, they got a bunch of money from lobbyists in Washington, D.C., and they started building. Three years later, they built that much railroad. So somebody who had matric in Washington said, hey, if we built that in three years, it's going to take us half a century to get across. So they had to make a change. 
They had to do something different. I'm going to back up here. That's what they did different. They didn't write 2,000 pieces of legislation. They just took out the word job reservation. And what happens when you take job reservation out of your policy? You hire whoever works. You hire whoever's got brains. And there were Chinese left over from the gold rush in San Francisco. All jobs are good jobs. And they've been working with Irishmen. Anybody here ever work with an Irishman? You work with an Irishman, you can work with anybody. That's why they were so good. They did all the jobs from 1965 on. They got all the top jobs, master blaster. They were 85% of employment. Chinese, and you won't believe it, blacks. Because they got rid of job reservation, blacks could work on the railroad too. Pretty soon you had 90% of the people working on the railroad that weren't allowed to before. Nearing the end, on a bet, they laid 16 kilometers of track in one day. Can Transnet do that in a month? This is 150 years ago. So it's not all giant machines and loaders. It's producing for the money you spend. And you can go from 20 bucks a day to 200 using your brain. You don't need a million dollar loader from Germany. Is it really so hard to make tomorrow better than yesterday? I would think it'd be easy. 